Thank you, Alan. Good morning, good afternoon, whatever. Um, I had a great time because I went to the Loving Yoga earlier. Uh, it has been a wonderful conference for me. It's not just work, it's fun, something I love to do. It has been a pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Stonic. Is that uh, I, I knew her for a long while. And then until when I became the uh, board member at CSWE, I, and I acquainted her more uh, deeply. And uh, she has having a lot of impact in social work, Title IV E, and also in social policy. It's a very honor to in, for me to introduce her. Dr. Snodney work has focus on forging academic agency partnership and on strengthening the bridges between research, practice, policy, and education. She currently serves as a director of the National Association of Social Workers Think Tank, Social Work Policy Institute. Dr. Sura is an internationally recognized expert on workforce issues and author of numerous publications and monographs including uh, on assessing federal funding, child welfare partnerships, competencies, and evidence-based practice. If you have a question about federal funding, you ask her. I just ask her, when is the grant money being released so I can work? <laughs> she has, she has uh, been uh, studying the history and policy impacting the use of Title IV E funds in social education and has taught child welfare practice and child welfare policy. She currently serves on the Institute of Medicine's Committee on Child Maltreatment Research Policy and Practice for the next decade. The, is the future, okay? The dual eligible beneficiary of the work group of the National Quality Forum's Measure Application Partnership and the CDC Knowledge to Action Think Tank on Child Maltreatment Prevention and the National Advisory Committee for the Char National Child Welfare Workforce Institute. It's a long history. Dr. Sonic has been a consultant to the Children's Bureau and to the National Institute of Health and has several foundation-funded projects on interprofessional education and practice, university agency research partnership, and competences for family-centered care. Dr. Sonic has a BA from the University of Rochester and MSSSW from the University of Wisconsin and Medicine, and a PhD in social work from the University of Maryland, uh, Baltimore. She told me she drives uh, around Washington area, and uh, she could manage the traffic, and I'm, I'm very impressed. I need to <laughs> consult her how to do that. She's an NASW social work pioneer, and was the 2012 Alumni of the Year for the University of Maryland School of Social Work. Let's welcome Dr. Sony. Thank you. I know that I am standing here as the uh, kind of bridge between uh, the morning sessions, which were really good, and lunch and music. And so I will uh, try my best to um, keep you all awake as we uh, go forward. I'm really, really pleased to be here. As many of you know, promoting Title IV E funding and promoting the role of social workers in public child welfare has been my uh, mission for the past uh, 25 years. It was probably 25 years ago that I got to know Alvin. This is really the first time I've seen Alvin that he hasn't been wearing a cowboy hat. I don't know if it's a transition from uh, New Mexico uh, to Texas. But when I was working at NASW the first time from 87 to 94, there was this uh, tall man who was always wearing cowboy boots and a hat. Now he wears sandals because he's in Galveston. <laughs> and he was all about child welfare. And uh, one of my colleagues at NASW went to visit New Mexico and came back and said, you know, they've started this MSW program in New Mexico State, and they're using this federal funding. And we began to sort of realize that some other states were doing that as well. And so Alvin has been such an important person in the field in terms of being an early uh, adapter and a consultant and role model for so uh, many of us. So I was really pleased to be here. Uh, Alvin had asked me, I, and Patrick had asked me two years ago to speak at the conference when it went national. 
and I was going to Italy and France for a few weeks, and he kept saying, but you could bring your husband, go to Galveston. Go to Galveston. <laughs> we did go to Italy and France, and you know, uh, <laughs> both of Mexico is good, but Tuscany and Provence, maybe better. Uh, but I didn't want to say no again. I think I sort of felt like, I sort of at the point of my career that if he didn't ask, if he asked me this year and I didn't um, come, there might not be a next year. Or who knows what I'm going to be doing next year? So I was really very, very pleased uh, to come. I had also had the opportunity. Um, Nancy Chapman is here. Uh, to come to I think the year that the original roundtable went Texas to regional. I had the opportunity to come, and that was kind of in a little motel outside of San Marcos. And so the idea that this has become sort of a national meeting and sort of a high-class uh, hotel has really shown, I think, that we can use that as a metaphor for Title IV-E uh, support for uh, social work education and uh, the preparation of BSWs and MSWs uh, for child welfare careers. So when I was asked, I wasn't kind of told what to speak about, so I thought, well, what do I want to speak about? And I, I'll touch on Title IV, certainly in what I talk about now, and also uh, Jessica Price and I will be presenting this afternoon on the survey that we did of uh, schools of social work that were using Title IV funds to support BSWs and MSWs. But I really wanted to do a presentation that I think both reflects on where social work and child welfare have traveled together and could be traveling in the future, as well as a little of my own journey in these 25 years in national uh, social work organizations. And so I sort of came up with this title, Social Work and Child Welfare, looking back to look ahead. And I think it's particularly important in uh, 2012, as you all know, was the 100th anniversary of the Children's Bureau, and social work has such a rich history, you know, from the very beginnings um, of the Children's Bureau. So one of the things that actually we did, and some of you might have seen this before, is in commemoration of the 100th anniversary of the Children's Bureau, uh, NASW created this poster, and it is available from uh, NASW's store, but we did it for the uh, 100th anniversary of the Children's Bureau, which was celebrated at the uh, Child Abuse and Neglect Conference in April 2012, where we did a reception and we were able to give copies of it to uh, some of the key people, including uh, Carol Spigner, who as Carol Williams had been head of the Children's Bureau in the Clinton administration, Dorothy Harris, who kind of in a way got me into this role around promoting professional social work and child welfare because when she was president of NASW in 1987, from 85 to 87, she had a presidential initiative. And her presidential initiative was about um, professionalizing child welfare. And there was a task force and a committee and it had all these uh, goals that they wanted the committee to um, take on, that NASW should take on, and so I got hired at NASW in 19, April 1987 on a part-time temporary basis to help implement the agenda for this uh, promoting professional social work and public child welfare uh, agenda that had been uh, developed during Dorothy's presidency. And little did I know that the person who hired me was about to leave, and so I got to be the sort of broader staff for the Family Commission. But um, out of that early effort, when I was hired in 1987, we really began to collaborate both more with the Children's Bureau as well as the Child Welfare League of America, with the uh, National Association of Public Child Welfare Administrators, with the Council on Social Work Education, and really forged some partnerships at the national level that um, helped foster partnerships at the state and local level, and partnerships at the state and local level help forge greater partnerships uh, at the national level. So it really was a critical time. So uh, the question is, have we had 100 years of progress? So if we go back to the creation of the Children's Bureau in 1912, that was the place the Children's Bureau was created in the Department of Labor to really provide a federal home, a federal role to promote the economic, social, and physical well-being of children. 
it had a very holistic view of children. And it's something that it's important to remember as we now in 2013 have all of this focus on child well-being and emotional and social development, it's really not something new, it's something that's quite old and perhaps we might have lost our way along the way. Uh, in 1921, the Shepherd Towner Act was the beginning of an early home visiting program. It was repealed because there was great opposition from the American Medical Association to have these sort of non-physicians um, working in people's homes. Of course, what did we end up with? We ended up in, um, 19, in, in 2010 in the Affordable Care Act with money for early childhood home visiting after you know, many sort of pilots along the way. But what if Shepherd Towner had never been, had never ended and uh, had never been repealed and if it had kept going? And um, you know, people have written about, since the early heads of the Children's Bureau were social workers, five out of the top first six uh, heads of the Children's Bureau, and then a number of people after that, but when the Children's Bureau was really uh, sort of a, a bigger, broader um, growing agency where it was really, look, it was the place where issues related to children were being looked at. Uh, social work had a very, very critical role both in terms of the leadership of the Children's Bureau as well as in uh, being resources um, to the Children's Bureau at the same time that the social work profession was um, being developed. And then in the Social Security Act of 1935, we have the creation of Title V, which was the maternal and child welfare provisions, as well as aid to dependent children in terms of um, Title um, Four, and I wanted to um, particularly uh, read to you. I'm more organized than I thought. I put it in here actually. I wanted to uh, read to you something that actually comes from an early Children's Bureau report. Uh, this is something that, as many of you know, uh, the Ch Child Welfare Information Gateway and the Children's Bureau put together a great deal of historic information about the history of the Children's Bureau for this 100th birthday. And there's a timeline, if you kind of, and there's a brochure, if you begin to click through these things, you find things that were written in 1935, 36, 37, about social work and the commitment of the Children's Bureau to invest in social work. And uh, one of the things that was said in the report from the director of the Children's Bureau, it was published in 1940, but I think it was the report about child welfare in 1936-37, and it says, it's evident that the persons employed must be qualified by both formal training and actual experience to undertake a child welfare program. Because of great emphasis in the majority of the states upon residents and the limited number of qualified children's workers available in many parts of the country, edu educational leave has been granted by 35 states and Hawaii to a total of 257 persons since February 1936 to enable them to attend professional schools of social work. So this is not new. And I always kind of thought it started like in 1962, but it's when I began to look at some of these documents from the Children's Bureau's uh, 100th birthday that were put together. And I'm sorry there's no one from the Child Welfare Information Gateway that's here. Um, I know their materials are here, but. No, she's. Chris Tatham yeah. was here. Okay. Right. Anyhow, um, they're great uh, resources, particularly for those of you who teach child welfare uh, policy or teach uh, the history of social welfare policy overall. Uh, it's really um, an important piece. So, uh, you know, what happened next? Maybe sort of um, a next big place was the passage of the um, Social Security Amendments to create Title IV-B in personal social services in 1962. And that was really the beginning of the Title IV B426 discretionary grant program that included the training grants, where in most cases, while it didn't specifically say schools of social work, in the beginning, that's really where those funds um, were going. 
And in the end, so far, that's where those funds are going. Although some of those years in between, they went a lot of other places. Um, I think one of the other critical pieces, if we reflect once again on where we are today in terms of looking more holistically and looking at the um, health and social development of uh, children who come into contact with the child welfare system or, we're, or that we're trying to prevent from coming into contact with the child welfare system, is that maternal and child health was part of the Children's Bureau up until the 1960s when as the federal government and the sort of HEW bureaucracy began to grow, the health part, the maternal and child health part, went off to what's now the Health Resources and Services Administration, HRSA, had another name at the time, and the child welfare piece stayed in the Children's Bureau and what was the, I think, when I first got involved was the Social and Rehabilitation Services, SRS, I think it was. And if you read the work of Virginia Inslee and some of the people who uh, were real champions of maternal and child health, they'll probably say this is one of the best things that ever happened. And if you talk to Charles Gershenson, who was at the Children's Bureau for many, many years, he would say it was one of the worst things that ever happened. And interestingly enough, in the Affordable Care Act with the Home Visiting Program, it's being jointly administered through the Children's Bureau and the Bureau of Maternal and Child Health. They have to work together now. And um, it really, once again, it's like, well, gosh, if these things had never been divided out, and we hadn't sort of segmented the health part of vulnerable children from the protection, child welfare part of vulnerable children, would we have had a sort of a more holistic view of um, what needs to be done? The next thing that happened that I think is critically important happened when I was in social work school in the early 70s, and that was the division between income supports and child welfare services. And kind of thinking, or, or I think maybe it wasn't what the thinking was, but I think became the actualization that determining people's eligibility for AFDC were clerical functions, and it kind of separated out the sort of clerical functions from the clinical functions. And once again, we look at the numbers and we, um, and I know Ken was talking a little about this um, yesterday in terms of some of the work going on at San Diego State and San Diego County and the other counties that they serve, that the issues of poverty are ones we've never resolved. And in many cases, we don't even try to resolve them. And one of the things that I sort of, if I were to reflect on my career, and I think, well, gosh, 25 years ago when I started working at the national level, the figures were that one in four children uh, were living in poverty. But then we sort of had some successes, and I think we got up to about one in six. And what happened? We're now back to one in four. So, um, you know, maybe that was sort of another place that we sort of um, made the mistake and, um, was also, I think, a time when some of the term that some people will use, although I've never particularly liked it, of uh, deprofessionalization sort of really began to occur where people kind of really started leaving the public sector. It was also the time of great growth of the uh, community mental health movement and you know, great big mental health centers that provided all sorts of clinical services. And so you also saw this sort of growing sort of level of services. The early 1970s to 1975, huge number of social programs that passed in the Nixon administration, the Older Americans Act, the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act, um, special education laws, um, you know, uh, Supreme Court decisions on Roe v. Wade. It was really a very critical time but it really kind of created many, 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 many kinds of um, opportunities, developmental disability programs, many, many opportunities uh, for social workers to kind of uh, move out and sort of beyond uh, child welfare. 1974 saw the passage of the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act, and I think this is critical because it also, as it's developed over the last 40 years, has really changed the tenor of how child welfare services are provided or how we think about the people who are providing those services. 
Because when I first was working in the late 70s, early 80s in some services, it would not be unusual to say to a parent who needed child care help, well, you know, you should go and report yourself to the Child Protective Services folks because then you, you would be eligible for subsidized um, child care. And it just doesn't work that way anymore. Um, but that really was a very different time because uh, it was the time of Title 20. And one of the things that uh, I discovered in putting together Roxana Tariqa Marubia at NASW, and I worked a lot to sort of go through old NASW news and things like that to work on the poster that we did on the Children's Bureau. And part of what we found was a key role that NASW had and NASW leaders and NASW board in the original uh, creation of the t Title 20, which is now the Social Services Block Grant, which is such a small amount of money that it becomes low-hanging fruit for Republicans to think about zeroing out even though it's the major funder of, of child protective services and um, adult protective services um, in the country, among other um, services. So what comes next? Uh, the Adoption Assistance and Child Welfare Act of 1980, Title IV-E, the round table for which we are here. And that was happening just as I was uh, working, running a foster care program for kids with special needs in uh, Northern Virginia. And Title IV-E was all about permanency planning and was building on the work that had been piloted in Oregon and California and some other places about trying to reunify children with their families, trying to prevent placement altogether, as well as wanting to make sure that children with special needs did not uh, language in, languish in out-of-home <laughs> care and foster care by creating adoption assistance incentives so that people who otherwise may not perhaps have been able to afford to adopt a child could adopt a child. So these were really, really critical um, goals. And it was just such an important piece of legislation. But something kind of happened along the way, and I'll talk about it a little more as I talk a little more specifically about Title IV-E, that um, kind of made 96272 as a whole not implemented really the way the people who had worked on it had hoped that it was going to be implemented. And some of that had to do, or maybe much of it had to do with the election of Ronald Reagan and sort of what happened after that uh, from another different spheres. It took quite a long time for uh, another piece of child welfare legislation of any major ilk to take place, 13 years. And uh, what came next was the Family Preservation and uh, Family Support Amendments. Once again, focusing on family support <laughs> with the idea about uh, prevention and you know, a lot of conversation about are we gonna provide services that are sort of universal or targeted or identified for only those who are already um, you know, at extreme risk or receiving services? And are we looking at um, family preservation as both you know, intensive in-home services as well as supports to help make stronger reunification efforts? Great idea very little money, and as time went on, it was renamed the Promoting Safe and Stable Families Program, now the Stephanie Tubbs-Jones Safe, Safe and Stable Families Program. Um, they began to say, okay, well, a small amount of money, but let's make sure we use some of it for um, adoption, so that if adoptions are, so that we can sort of try to prevent adoption disruption, and let's use some of it for this and some of it for that. So um, it was like well-intentioned, but never kind of happened exactly the way those of us who advocated wanted it to happen. Uh, next, it, what's turned out to be a pretty big thing that's kind of come and gone and come again, a Title IV -E waivers. They began in 1994. The idea was once again that 4E was about foster care and adoption. What were we going to do to actually provide supports and services to families some of those services that were originally intended to be supported by the Social Services Block Grant or other funding streams 
but the, the, the funding wasn't there or the structures weren't there. What were we going to do to um, kind of upfront or sort of have more flexible use of that money? And uh, Title IV e waivers began in 1994. They uh, went uh, through to about 2006 or 7. They were reauthorized again in uh, 2009, 2010, I think. Uh, and now there were nine funded last year, and I think they're trying to fund 10 a year, and there's three years of them. Looking very importantly at evaluation, but I think it's one of the things to, to note in, in this kind of meeting is that uh, part of the information that was able to sort of get congressional support to reauthorize Title IV waivers was the fact that there were very rigorous evaluations done of the waivers. A lot of them used randomized designs and um, they were really able to show difference and certainly some of the work of Mark Testa when he was in Illinois and he continues in North Carolina around uh, kinship care and things like that that really um, showed that it made a difference for permanency for kids were really critically important. However, when uh, the waivers were reauthorized in uh, 2011 in the uh, Child Welfare Services Innovation and Adoption, um, Innovation and Implementation Act, it specifically says that states do not, well, how does it kind of say it? That when reviewing the applications, HHS cannot consider the design that the um, is going to be used for the evaluation. So basically it says you don't have to use a random design, which of course was part of the value of the program. 1997, the Adoption and Safe Families Act. Time limits for foster care, incentives to the system for adoption. You got adoption bonuses. I don't know. I'm sure, I, I wonder sometimes if the jury is out on this, and they're actually trying to do the same thing in England right now. Um, did we make some adoptions that maybe happened too quickly? That um, we didn't do enough screening of who the adoptive parents were? That we didn't have enough supports because we were under the gun? I remember, you know, maybe these are anecdotal rumors, but in some agencies there was also <coughs> like a kind of a written rule to workers. Um, for every one case you opened, you had a close to. I mean, you take into account what the needs of the families are. So I've always been a little leery about the Adoption and Safe Families Act. But I remember at the time doing some um, focus groups for the Children's Bureau about the implementation and what people thought they needed. And the issue of training was very important. And I also remember sitting in meetings and people, one of the provisions of the Adoption and Safe Families Act also related to concurrent planning, something that had been done in the state of Washington in a pretty small scale way. And certainly it was written into federal legislation, as we are wont to do all the time, without having had any particularly rigorous uh, evaluation or really large scale uh, piloting and implementation. And suddenly people were talking about concurrent planning. And I remember going to meetings and people would be talking about what concurrent planning was. And basically they were just using exactly the same words they had used as permanency planning, but had added the word concurrent in front of it. But I think the other dilemma, if you think about this from a worker's perspective, of how easy is it to try both to be working with uh, a set of parents or a set of uh, family members around reunification at the same time you're preparing and looking for adoptive parents. What mixed messages? So I've always had sort of a, um, a kind of values on discomfort, I think more with the Adoption and Safe Families Act than um, some of the other child welfare uh, provisions that have occurred in the last uh, 45 or so years. I don't, we can discuss in the question and answer part what your own uh, experiences are uh, with it. Uh, the next big piece, uh, 2008 Fostering Connections, uh, it focused on youth aging out of foster care, it focused on the health needs, so you're beginning to kind of get to this sort of sense of holism when we were talking about uh, and, uh, uh, permanency and safety and well-being 
that you're beginning to sort of get touches in 2008 in fostering connections around um, well-being. So where do I think we are today in terms of our 100 years of progress or not? We're certainly talking more and more about the importance of income and social service support programs to optimize well-being and the need to use multiple systems. And I know for those of you who are last, here last year, Dave Burns uh, is now in DC uh, at the uh, Department of Human Services in DC. This is Dave's mantra and has been for a long time about, you know, these are the same families and we have to stop looking at them in silos and serve them uh, much more holistically. There is, you know, movements to be able to get uh, more data that can be looked at across systems and trying to figure out what to do with this. Um, Christy uh, Shook Slack at, um, or Slack Shook, I never get it right, at the University of Wisconsin, I should be able to do that. And um, her colleague Lonnie Berger are doing a uh, child um, maltreatment prevention uh, initiative where they're actually looking at providing economic subsidies to the families uh, to help and sort of see what that does in terms of child maltreatment prevention. Uh, there are some, some interesting studies because if you look at the um, National Child Abuse and Neglect Reporting System, the N NCANS data that the uh, states report to uh, HHS and then HHS publishes, uh, the rates of child abuse uh, have been going down in terms of physical abuse and sexual abuse. The rates of child fatalities have not been going down. Child neglect, therefore, becomes a much bigger part of the percentage of uh, instances of child abuse and neglect, up to about 78% now overall. And so there's been some interesting studies looking at hosp children's hospital admissions of, of abuse of head trauma. And um, what are some of the other proxies? And so what people found in the economic recession, uh, one of the studies that was done by Joanne Wood and some of her colleagues at the Policy Lab Children's Hospital of Pennsylvania, looks at uh, admissions and finds that one of the characteristics was not um, uh, people being out of work, but was home foreclosures. That home foreclosures, that, that change in status, that means when you sort of lose your home, put kids at risk of uh, child abuse and emergency room admissions to children's hospitals. Uh, Rachel Berger at the University of Pittsburgh has also done some great research on this, and there's a lot of thinking about we can't just look at child maltreatment reports because we know that all child maltreatment is not reported um, to CPS. There's a lot of other factors. So, um, so we're sort of back to this holistic picture that we started at in the Children's Bureau. We also, I think, are much more cognizant that there's a need for differential services based on age and developmental stage of the children and that the work of Fred Wolchin and some other people that's really looked at data about uh, the number of children uh, coming into care between zero and one, years old, one year old, the issues of kids who age out of care and they're looked for sort of connection to family. Um, it's not just the services they need, but sort of connection to family are, are really um, critical. And I think we also have a much greater understanding of the differential ages and stages related to parents. And perhaps with the Affordable Care Act and the fact that more people, will, more adults will be eligible for Medicaid, which will help people get more services, including mental health services, there's a hope that that will also help parents do a better job of getting health care services for their children who may be, be eligible for health care services through Medicaid or SCHIP, uh, but bless you, but are not um, necessarily getting them now. Uh, a lot of talk, I don't think in DC, I don't go to a meeting related to kids' issues that um, don't talk about, um, should we be taking more of a public health approach? Should we be looking at this more from a population health model rather than the way we have approached child welfare, which is sort of case by case, individual by individual. And also with all of the discussion related to uh, trauma, are we um, 
looking much more at um, what are the mental health approaches to address safety and well-being. And these are issues both related to the mental health issues of risk, uh, who are um, mothers most likely to lose custody of their children. They're women, if you control for all other factors, they're women who have mental health problems. Um, and what can we do to sort of address safety and well-being? Uh, home visiting in the front of the Affordable Care Act is uh, a critical issue. But we also know that there's insufficient availability of appropriate mental health services, whether for children or for adults. And I was talking with someone at HHS the other day who's involved in the implementation of the, affordable, uh, of the home visiting provisions of the Affordable Care Act, who is saying that as the evidence-based home visiting programs have been rolled out, particularly those that were being funded by OCAN, the Office of Child Abuse and Neglect, prior to the passage in 2010, uh, what they're finding in more home visiting is the high need for mental health services for the parents, and they're not available, plus the way the home visiting provisions are, as they are currently, the home visiting programs are not um, able to provide the mental health services themselves. But these are things that have very big implications for the social work profession, because absent uh, David Olds and their family partnership programs, the other uh, evidence-based interventions as a whole uh, employ social workers. And uh, one of the things that's both, I think, a, a plus and a curse for the social work profession is that we work in all these different programs, we work in all these different sectors, but we ourselves become very siloed in it. I'm or only an early interventionist. I'm only a child welfare worker. I only do investigation. I only do this. And we're not particularly as we get more advanced, we're not sort of be all people. And even, we have had many conversations with folks at HHS um, from NASW around um, implementation of ideas around integrated care, that just because you are looking at models to provide behavioral health services within primary care, doesn't mean you still don't have a need for social workers who might be care managers and working with people around their health needs, which is different than the therapeutic, psychotherapeutic intervention. So we have these multiple roles, and I think uh, implementation of the Affordable Care Act provides great opportunity for the social work profession, even though the word social work are not sort of all over the bill, the kinds of things that need to happen in terms of keeping people out of hospitals. Part of the way you keep people out of hospitals is making sure that they have transportation to get to their follow-up visits, making sure they use their medication, they can afford their medication, ad addressing some of their family caregiving issues that uh, they might have or the family caregiver problems, all important roles um, for social workers. And I also um, was thinking about this whole idea about the attention to um, public health model is it something that's really sort of a, a mirror of what Kedushin would really talk about in terms of the developmental perspective in child welfare? And uh, we really haven't had that perspective much at all. Uh, we've really looked at child welfare really in terms of service needs rather than in that holistic way. So what else has changed? I think we have an increased uh, focus on using data and research. Uh, that was sort of addressed in Alvin's um, introduction of uh, Patrick and some of the important work that Patrick has been doing in terms of matching uh, the child and family service research, uh, outcomes uh, to who the workers are is, is all really important. The kind of work that's going on in California where there's a real effort to use data in North Carolina, Pittsburgh, in Pennsylvania, uh, Illinois, a number of states to really use data. Some of the work of the data archive at, uh, at Chapin Hall, uh, the, this, the National Study of Child and Adolescent Well-Being, another great resource that really tells us a lot more than we knew about who are the children who come into contact with the child welfare system and what happens with them. But in sort of funding the second cohort, there's less money, less follow-up, not gonna get as much of the data as the first time um, through. Another piece I think that um, is represented from sort of like sort of, this is just like a little bit of the body of research, is about the issues around system change 
and that bureaucracies are sort of hard to change and hard to manage, but we really need to look at organizational culture and climate and sort of what happens and what are the issues related to leadership changes, what are the issues related to politicizing the well-being of children that don't end up resulting in great outcomes for the children. We have a complex set of federal funding streams for child welfare services, and these are just a few of them, sort of alphabet soup, and have to put this together. Uh, we did a meeting a few weeks ago on looking at sort of preparing social work students for policy careers and what needed to happen. And Linda Spears, who some of you may know, is Vice President of the Child Welfare League of America, was one of the people that I asked to speak at this meeting to talk about she hires policy staff, many of whom have been social workers over the years. You know, what does she look for? And she said, you know, one of the complex pieces is she wants someone to have sub substantive knowledge because the Child Welfare League of America doesn't have the number of staff they used to have when they had all these area, you know, experts. So we have these policy people who hopefully have some understanding from the ground about child welfare services. And then they have these funding streams that are sort of divided up in congressional committees. Some are in the Senate Finance and House Ways and Means Committee uh, in terms of 4B, 4E, Social Services Block Grant, TANF, and others like uh, the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act, uh, other health professions legislation, some of the other justice legislation are um, in the Health Committee in the Senate or Commerce and Commerce um, in the House. Different staff, different jurisdictions, difference if it's an entitlement than if it's something that um, is, has to be both authorized or reauthorized and appropriated. And it's like a puzzle. And Annie Casey and some others um, you know, have pretty good documents out on what all the funding streams are and what are some ideas around um, maximizing them. One of the things that NASW got involved with, that I've been very involved with over the last few years, is a small coalition that was the National Coalition to End Child Abuse Deaths. It was a coalition of NASW, the National District Attorneys Association, the uh, Center for uh, the Review of Child Deaths and Prevention of Child Deaths, that's a HRSA-funded center that uh, works with all the child death review committees in um, every state, Every Child Matters Fund, and the National Children's Alliance, which is the National Organizations for Children Advocacy Centers, as opposed to the Alliance for Children and Families, which is the Organization of Family Service Agencies, or the National Alliance for Children's Trust Funds. So, you know, if you think about Children's Alliance, I'm sure there's even more of them, but you have to make sure you're talking about the right one. Uh, so this coalition kind of came together with the idea that as child abuse and death, as, as child abuse and neglect rates were going down, child abuse death rates were not going down. They were uh, potentially going up. No one really knew the number. NCAN says there's like 1,560. Uh, the National Institute of Study says the number is bigger than that. The GAO did a report in 2011 that said the number might be closer to uh, 2,500. Uh, the, the National Center of the Death Review Committees figures that the number is closer to 2,500. And that there's not a national outcry about this. So the, uh, Every Child Matters had done this report called We Can Do Better. It profiled one child um, in each state who had died from abuse and neglect. About half of those were known to the Child Protective Service Agency, and half of them were not. So we were trying to get some congressional attention to this, and NASW was interested in this for a number of reasons. Well, a, because no child should die from child abuse and neglect. B, because part of them are system problems, either in terms of people not reporting child abuse and neglect because it's a teacher or maybe a physician or a therapist who kind of thinks this was sort of abuse, but you know, maybe it wasn't so bad. And if I make the report and it's not responded to right, I ruined my therapeutic relationship with this family. And then, um, you know, what, what is the agency going to do anyhow because they follow up and they decide there wasn't enough information to accept the report, or there wasn't enough information to found the case, or whatever it is, so nothing's gonna happen anyhow. So 
So you have that problem on sort of the front end, even though people are mandated reporters, you know, in different systems, there's a different response. Uh, one of my uh, children was working in a school system in a uh, community-based, you know, kind of mental health program, and there was a really low uh, threshold in terms of making reports. If, a, you know, parents, if a child said, my father, when I was visiting him, hit me three years ago, they made a report. Next year, she was at a hospital, big city hospital, working with adolescents, and she'd say, oh, I think I need to make a report. that oh, we don't do that here. Um, so we don't, you know, we don't have consistency in, you know, one city, and it is a city of um, almost eight million people, but still, um, we don't have consistency. And then, of course, there's inconsistency across uh, state laws in terms of is it serious, severe, or or anything, you know. Um, so we work to get um, some media attention at the national level because to get a lot of media attention, usually if there's a child death at the state level, particularly if CPS was involved and you know looking for someone's head to roll, maybe we could fire a few workers. Uh, in the Benita Jacks case in the district, six workers were fired, they've all been hired um, back. Um, the child welfare director eventually was fired, resigned, and um, you know she was a social worker, she was in the right place, or the wrong, wrong place, whatever. Um, she died a little while after that of cancer. A really sad story of people, you know, what happened. So, because everyone, someone's health to rule. However, when people die in hospitals, unless it's like really egregious, they study it. They figure out what went wrong and they change it. In child welfare, we fire these people over here, we create a committee over here to study it. We get a new director, he doesn't like the study, she doesn't like the study, they're coming to do something else, and nothing changes. We need to kind of look much more at that sort of medical, what they do in hospitals, and sort of much more of a learning organization kind of thing, because we have to learn from these things. Instead, we just change the players and have musical chairs. So, um, so we were successful at the very end of the 112th Congress, in getting a piece of legislation passed to create a national uh, commission to study child deaths. The president has six appointees to make. He hasn't made them yet. All six that members of Congress had to make um, have been made. It's a two-year commission, and um, hopefully there'll be good outcomes from it that will really give us some guidance on um, how to do this better, and we'll also address some of the workforce and staffing and training issues. Some of you may have seen the research that um, was uh, done in um, uh, at Bridgewater uh, State, one of the faculty there who did a national survey of um, child welfare workers, asking them questions about how they deal with child fatalities, and I think um, it's a pretty high number I don't have right here, but I can look it up, um, that um, had um, experienced a fatality on their caseload. I, and also, you know, you know, people said they'd gotten training, but they needed more training, and the people who had training, you know, felt they could deal with the situation better. So, as I was thinking about this, and thinking about, if we think about well-being, which is our sort of paradigm for today, that's what, you know, Brian Samuels, as Commissioner of ACYF, has been uh, speaking about uh, since 2009, that we could actually think about it in terms of the child, in terms of supportive caregivers, physical and mental health, safe and secure living arrangements, economic security. And if we thought about it, what are we here about? We're also here about the well-being of workers. And so what do workers need? Educa supportive and educational supervision, reasonable workloads, skills, knowledge, and resources to implement evidence-based interventions, and quality organizational culture and climate. So you have these sort of parallels in terms of well-being, and Harry Spence, when he was director of child welfare in Massachusetts, would talk about this in terms of this sort of parallel thing is we abuse the workers and we abuse the kids. We, the workers don't, but um, the kids are abused, the workers are in the system that are supposed to respond to them are abused as well. So the gaps for uh, the children, uh, I don't know if 
quickly, but you know, social and emotional well-being, uh, physical. We know that kids have very uh, high health needs when they're in the child welfare system. They have developmental lags. There's issues of economic insecurity. And as much as we've been talking about it for 25 years, still, kids still come into care because their families don't have housing. Uh, what are some of the gaps for the parents? Access to health care. Access to well-paying jobs access to adequate housing and child care, access to transportation, access to behavioral health services, access to maltreatment prevention services, access to community supports, and action, access to culturally relevant services. Uh, Carol uh, Spikner talks about this quite a bit in terms of looking at institutional racism, where a mother comes and she said, I went to that substance abuse program that was run by X church, and the worker says, or the judge says, Oh no, that program doesn't count. <coughs> Culturally relevant meant meaning for the mother, but not the workers. Um, Olivia Golden, who uh, some of you may know, who was Assistant Secretary for Children and Families in the Clinton administration and had been the um, Commissioner of ACYF in the uh, first uh, Clinton administration, has been for the last number of years at the Urban Institute after a stint at, um, as the uh, interim director of the Department of Children and Family Services at, in the District of Columbia. And when she uh, left the DC office and she went to uh, the Urban Institute, she really began to think sort of from a research perspective, what were some of the common characteristics of the um, mothers who are most at risk, or for some of the kids who uh, died or were severely injured during her watch in the DC department. And she uh, looked at, and basically has been looking at the sort of interplay between poverty and depression and doing some work in that area. And uh, this I took from Olivia, and hopefully gave her credit for it. But sort of, really, if we think about well-being, so what is the risk that um, poverty poses for kids, parental stress, health, mental health problems, this issues of the low education of parents, there's a lot of, been a lot of talk in the last few days, there was a big article in the Washington Post a few days ago about the importance of reading to kids and you know, visitors who come into homes and help moms and dads see the importance of that. A lot of issues around food insecurity at uh, the Society for Social Work and Research Conference, there were some good sessions that people were doing with this whole issue of food insecurity has uh, gotten a lot of attention. Uh, low wage work and its effect on, uh, on families where people are working but they're not making ends meet. Uh, family and neighborhood violence, which of course uh, Marlon and uh, Ken addressed yesterday. Uh, the lack of access to early childhood and K-12 programs, unstable and uns unsafe housing. And how do these risks affect uh, child develop development? Uh, parents and parents' well-being are central. Stability matters. Timing matters. Greater vulnerability during infancy, but other periods are important too. And multiple co risks cause multiple damage. So we have sort of this issue around the well-being of kids and their families. So like getting back to that sort of parallel, so what does it mean for workers? Uh, this is from uh, Dorothy Harris and NESW News from the 1980s, 19, late 80s, I think this was, for a congressional hearing. Uh, I came across Don Mattingly, who spent about four years or so as director of child welfare in New York City, and was child welfare director in Ohio, and has worked for Andy Casey for a long time. I came across a 1999 article from Youth Today that John Mattingly had written that I had saved, I didn't even realize it. It said, workforce matters. <laughs> what are the gaps for workers? We know supervision, caseloads, autonomy, support for clinical judgments, the liability, the media scrutiny. What if I do something wrong? What's going to happen? I'm going to see myself on the news tomorrow. Uh, limited recognition of professional role, vulnerable to the political client, access of a learning organization, culture, and climate, and the insufficient ability, um, availability of quality services and supports for children and families. In the Journal of Family Strengths, uh, there was an article in um, one of 
the recent publications that Tracy Whitaker, my colleague at NASW, did, where she compared two of the reports she's done related to the social work workforce. One was uh, done in terms of the reports that you're right for the job, it's the best job in the world, and the other was the national study of um, licensed social workers, you know, really looking at this issue that for those people who are social workers, have social work degrees, or NASW members, what they report are the biggest issues are about the availability of services to kids. What the regular workers report in some of the studies that APHSA has done or others has to do with um, more organizational concerns in terms of uh, supervision and peer support. So people who have degrees who are working in child welfare settings, and we don't really know if those are public or private settings, so I know some of the recent research has sort of been looking at sort of parsing that out. We don't know that from that study, but they had you know, much more positive things to say. So it's important to look at sort of the educated workforce and the general workforce to be able to sort of get some data. I, I also think the study that was done in California that uh, NCCD did around uh, looking at staff turnover and child abuse, where they compared different counties in California, that those that were the high functioning counties had the lowest turnover rates, the best paid staff, compliance with recognized practice standards, and they also have lower rates of re-abuse. So, you know, what's the picture of promoting a workforce and the well-being of the workforce? Uh, quality uh, and supportive uh, supervision, clinical and evidence-based knowledge to engage with families and promote strengths, hiring and the retention of competent staff, Applying evidence-informed retention strategies. We now actually know something about retaining staff, and we should be applying what we know. Promoting policies that fund social work education and professional development. I like this work. Creating and sustaining university agency partnerships, as we've seen in many conversations here today. Not always so easy. We need to build healthy organizational culture and climate. And based on Patrick's research, we will get better child welfare outcomes. What we don't have is a lot of other research that gets to outcomes. A lot of our research is um, on retention or turnover or burnout or organizational cultural climate. It's much harder to get to those outcomes because there's so many other factors that impact those outcomes. When I went to the doctoral program at the University of Maryland after working on the development of 4E and my question of, well, how come there was this funding source that has come from 1980 and no one was using it until Alvin and Woodard and some other people started saying, oh, you know, you could do this. Um, so I thought, but here I am, I had been working for NASW, social work degree should make a difference. So I, you know, would go to the doctoral program and they'd ask me, what do you want to do your dissertation on? I said, well, I want to do this intervention study about foster care and look at the you know, differential outcomes of those workers who have social work degrees and those that don't. And the answer everyone said is, you can't do that because there's too many intervening variables and it plus it would take too long and something to do for a dissertation. So instead, as many of you know, I instead did a retrospective policy analysis of how was it that um, the, the child welfare training provisions were there in 1980 and nobody implemented them. And it took um, some folks like Alvin and Kathy Breyer Lawson and others to kind of start going around and telling people that you could. It certainly was not the federal government that was telling anyone that you um, could. So that's what I ended up doing. Nothing to do with an intervention, but um, still needs to be done. And some people have worked on that, but and that's partly because we have more data now. We're able to do some of that research. So um, just uh, kind of where we could sort of go in terms of a social work degree. I think that we do have some research that says uh, social work degree and specialized child welfare training uh, do re result in improved outcomes for children. Shorter um, lengths of stay in care, more timely reunification. We know that it makes a difference in retention, in knowing the job, in feeling more confident in the job. Uh, less pre-service and in-service training required. Uh, retention saves money because you have less turnover and the high cost of turnover in staff. I think that um, we sort of move towards cultural competency 
uh, because it's something we sort of learn about. Do we do a good enough job? I don't think so at all. I think another issue is around ethical practice because we sort of understand the context of practice. And if you're just kind of coming in and doing the job, you don't sort of have that uh, ethical base. A few years ago, um, the American Public Human Service Association actually surveyed states about whether they had sort of an ethical code that they used. And some used an NASW code, some had their own code, and some had no code at all. And I think our person and environment orientation is really important. But our uh, research is inconsistent. Um, some studies say that those with the least relevant or least education are the most likely to leave. Other research says that they're most likely to stay because they don't have anywhere else to go. Um, you know, Yankulov and her colleagues at uh, Louisville, some, one of their studies says that those with MSWs are most likely to leave. Some studies only looked at those with social work degrees. Um, and certainly the study that um, is pretty well cited that Rick Barth and Nancy and some other colleagues did where they used NSCAR data did show an increased number of MSWs and BSWs, still proportionally more BSWs than MSWs in child welfare uh, relative to earlier um, research. So um, what can account for the difference? Part of it is different study questions, agency expectations of the employee, what is the job, what other job options people had, and that was certainly some of the work that was done in New York State when they looked at uh, turnover. Some of it had to do with counties where there really weren't other jobs, so people were staying. Supervision is a critical issue, and then certainly ethical um, practice. I sort of outlined here some of the retention um, strategies. This is from our uh, systematic review of uh, the research on retention that goes through um, I think the last studies we took were for April and May of 2004. In those in the nine years since then, there has been a much expanded body of uh, research in this area, and I um, really think that it's timely to do um, another review. I'm not going to go through all the factors because many of you have heard it, and you can all um, read it. But one of the findings certainly is that um, supervision is a critical issue. The Social Work Policy Institute and Casey Family Programs and the National Center for Child, National Child Welfare Workforce Institute uh, did a uh, supervision think tank uh, in uh, the fall of uh, 2010 with the idea of supervision as the safety net for frontline child welfare practice. That report is up on the SWIFI website. You can also use it for um, continuing education, all, all of the presentations and everything are um, up on the website. So, uh, and you know, there are the um, issues related to challenges and what our recommendations were. One of the recommendations was that there was a need for supervision standards and NASW has just come out with supervision standards. So those are kind of hot off the press as well as uh, NASW has uh, updated child welfare uh, standards that have just been approved as well. As I said, uh, there's this growing body of research around particularly organizational culture and climate. A lot of you in this room have sort of added um, to this research. Um, and some of it, the, the uh, knowledge and the th theoretical frameworks are not coming necessarily from uh, social work. Some of it's coming from social work, but some of it's coming from uh, understanding organizations, uh, psychology, um, and other fields, but very, very important, critical uh, work. I'm going to talk about for you this afternoon, so I won't talk about it so much um, now, but I think it's important to know, as I said, I would get to this, that the passage of 96272 happened in June 1980. Ronald Reagan was elected in November 1980. There were regulations that were actually promulgated 